Good morning, everybody, and also uh, good morning, uh, Professor William Kirby's. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Yes. So it's really it's a great pleasure for me to host this uh, CCG special dialogue. Uh, my name is uh, Henry Huiyao Wang. I'm the president and founder of the Center for China and Globalization. And the CCG spe special dialogue is uh, actually conducted for the last three years with over 40, 50 very well-known uh, global opinion leaders. And here today, we are at the Harvard campus, at the Winter Library, and also at the heart of the Harvard campus. So welcome to this special uh, dialogue program. And we are thrilled today, actually, uh, to have a dialogue with Professor William Kirby. And uh, William Kirby is a TM Chan Professor of China Studies at Harvard University and a Sprangler Family Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. And he's a Harvard professor, uh, also a distinguished service professor. He serves as a chairman of the Harvard China Fund, uh, the University Academic Venture Fund for China, and faculty chair of the Harvard Center Shanghai, Harvard's first university-wide center located outside the United States. So this is really a, a very great uh, achievement, I think, that <laughs> Bill is uh, achieving. And also, he's the former dean of Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and he has published and quoted in many uh, uh, distinguished, uh, well-known journals, uh, papers, and uh, of course, you have many, many books too, and many, many case studies. <laughs> the list is very long. So uh, just to uh, open this uh, dialogue, because we have actually uh, have done quite a few dialogue with our Harvard distinguished professors, including uh, Professor Larry Summers, Professor Joseph and I, Professor Graham Allison, and just to mention a few. So, so this time we want to engage our dialogue with, uh, with Bill. I mean, you've been engaged with Harvard Business School for a long time. You've been in various leading positions. I remember I was here uh, 2011 as a, a senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. You were looking after the Fairbank Center. <laughs> and also we had the chance to talk then. But of course, in the last 13, 14 years, uh, many things has, has changed. And uh, so you, your work examined the uh, uh, China business, economic, and political development in the international context. So, so particularly, uh, you, you are talking, you're actually, to, you just come back from China, you talked to me just now, and then uh, you have been uh, uh, teaching business, uh, you know, doing business in China and quite a number of courses at Harvard uh, Business School. So I know that you actually, uh, you know, I want to have, I want you to give an overview of what's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, global situation. But I, I really want to talk a bit more on this uh, great book you just uh, recently uh, published. It's Empire of Ideas, Creating the Modern University from Germany to America to China, uh, which published by Harvard University Press. So perhaps you, you can give some opening remarks, but also ex especially your latest uh, new book I, we really would like to introduce to our uh, CCD uh, audience, uh, both in China, outside China. So oh, thank you. Please. Thank you very much, Henry. It's a pleasure to have you back here at Harvard. Yeah. We look forward to having you early and often in, yes. the, in the future. So this book is an outgrowth both of my long-standing interest in China and China's development in an international context over the last several centuries, but also comes from my own experience as Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here at Harvard, which is about half of Harvard University. Um, uh, that, that school, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And it asks the question, and a very simple question, the Germans defined the modern research university in the 19th century. You know, universities are more than a millennium old in the West, but the modern research university, a place like Harvard or a place like Tsinghua or Fudan, uh, this model of a university is only about 233 years old this year. Hmm. Founded in Berlin in 1810, uh, and it becomes the model of all modern universities throughout the world. Uh, the Germans define excellence in the 19th century. The Americans arguably take it to another level by the end of the 20th century. And the question I am asking is whether or not Chinese universities will define global standards in the 21st century. So in education, as in other areas, is the 21st century to be the Chinese century. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a series of 
uh, case studies of individual universities, German, American, and Chinese, as well as a broad overview of higher education uh, in an area of enormous cooperation and competition uh, right now, in particular across the Pacific. And I'm just back from China. Uh, my mission in this last trip to China was to re-engage our academic partners uh, in China. Uh, knowing that any great university, and we like to think here at Harvard that we're not a, not a bad one, uh, that any great university has to engage with the fastest growing system of higher education in the world in quality as well as quantity, and that is of course the system in China. So I met with my counterparts and with the leaders of a number of great universities, Beida, Tsinghua, uh, uh, Fudan, and, uh, and others, also in Hong Kong, uh, to get a sense of, you know, how do we, after three years of COVID and after this serious downturn in U.S.-China relations, how do we reset our partnerships for the mutual benefit of our faculty and our students and indeed of both of our countries? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you Bill. That, that's really uh, fascinating. I think that uh, you are probably the most uh, authoritative and also a uh, highly relevant person, uh, expert, to, to, to also talk about this education and, of course, the origin of modern university. Uh, in your book, you talk about the university, how they started first in, in, in Germany, and I know that you also speak some, Ger you speak German, French, yep. and many <laughs> European language. And then, of course, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Harvard itself, I mean, how, how they moved to the U.S., and, uh, and then the, the, the Harvard campus, I mean, we see now here it's been uh, filled with visitors uh, on, the, on, the, on the regular basis, so you can see it's become the uh, uh, capital of the knowledge probably uh, for many universities uh, to, 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 to model, model down on, on Harvard's model. But uh, again, also Chinese universities are really uh, 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 rising and, and also even they have a relatively shorter history. But, but also if you talk about the, uh, uh, you know, Asian time, China always have some kind of uh, uh, study uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, scholars uh, academy like uh, Yuelo Su Yuan, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, sure. Like that. But, but I think modern university, it's it's really true that uh, has been the driving force of uh, of technology, uh, science, innovation, and of course, leading hubs for R and D. Uh, and so, so for 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 this, uh, uh, so what what do you think of the differences uh, that you you are the expert on this book that. Uh, uh, that the European universities, American university, and now uh, Chinese universities, we are now probably the three leading uh, forces uh, for for the future. Uh, what 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 is your comparison and, and findings and, and some of the well, ideas? Well, the reason let me take a step sure, backwards sure, a bit. Sure. Uh, the reason I call the book uh, "Empires of Ideas." Yes. Si shang zhi di guo. Okay. Uh, we think of it in, in Chinese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what makes a country great? What yes. makes a country enduringly great? Yeah. Is it the size of the economy? That's important. Mm. Is it the size of an army or a navy? Yeah, that may be important. But the greatest, the countries that have set global standards in multiple ways over the last several centuries have also been leaders in culture and ideas. Mm, yeah. uh, you look at the Da Qing Guo yes. in the 18th century in Asia or you look at France in the 18th century in Europe, mm -hmm. or in the 19th century, Britain and Germany uh, becoming global powers, but also by the strength of their, their ideas and the force of, uh, and, and particularly in the German case, the power of their universities. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, uh, this is, country has become uh, the greatest uh, center of higher education in the world for the moment, yeah. in part because we attract talent from all over the world, mm -hmm. from our, in our students and in our faculty uh, in particular. And if we were not open to this talent from all over the world, and if that talent did not wish to come here, mm -hmm. we would not be doing so well today. And right outside, we are meeting today in Widener Library, yes. um, the largest university library in the United States. Uh, and right outside this library is a stele, a shebei, Mm, that yes. was uh, given by the Chinese alumni of Harvard University in 1936 mm. on the 300th anniversary of Harvard. Mm. You know, Harvard is much older as a university than it is as a research university. Sure, sure. So we were founded in the late Ming Dynasty. That's right. After uh, all. Yes, yes. Although nobody at Harvard knew that. Okay. But in 1936, 
This stele was dedicated by the representative of Peking University, mm. of Beijing Da Xue, mm. uh, uh, Dr. Hu Shi. Hu Shi came to Harvard mm. and was given an honorary degree as the representative of mm. Beida at our 300th anniversary. And he inscribes that stele with a message mm. that it is mm. learning, mm. not power politics. Not, he doesn't say sure. it's not make a country great, but he says, above all, uh, a culture grows and a nation goes strong by attention to its culture, but a culture can become enduringly strong only by attention to learning. Yes. By xue, uh, in Chinese, as he put it, and we c I can show you this afterwards. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, or Wissenschaft, as you would say in the German case, you know, the idea of learning as science. Yes. And this is what has really propelled countries to the forefront of global influence over the course of the last several centuries. Mm -hmm. So an investment in education, and you know, no country knows this better in its long history than China, mm -hmm. an investment in education is the surest investment one can have for the future of one's country. So great, uh, Bill, that uh, you, you mentioned all those uh, the differences and also probably the, the core competence of a, of a modern university. I think you have, you know, uh, uh, strike me and then you really pick up some of the key word, the talent, you know, when, where university has to attract talents from all over the world. I think Harvard probably is the best example and also many universities uh, in the U.S. and uh, other countries too. So, so this is something probably we can learn from is that uh, uh, you being the dean of uh, uh, you know, arts and humanitarian for, for, for a long time at Harvard, you are very <laughs> knowledgeable. Uh, for the for the core competence, uh, how 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 university is run and what what are the uh, key competence? Of course, this uh, uh, talent. So 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 in that sense, I think probably Harvard has a very high percentage of uh, of international uh, faculties or people from different parts we of do. the world. Maybe you can give a little bit uh, 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 you know introduction there because we are at Harvard <laughs> sitting well. in the arts library of the U.S. campus, probably. So uh, this, is, this is actually very relevant to the current situation in U.S.-China relations. That's right. Uh, where COVID and, other for, and for other political reasons, the flow of talent across the Pacific mm -hmm. has been somewhat interrupted. Uh, but a great university has to be a place where you attract talent from around the world. China has the great advantage of having not just this enormous and talented population at home, yeah. but the Chinese diaspora, yeah. uh, which can come back and succeed in China, but also by welcoming international mm -hmm. uh, scholars as well. Um, sometimes uh, the Chinese government is criticized, I think uh, wrongly, for its uh, Thousand Talents program. Yes. Uh, but when I was dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, I had a Thousand Talents program as oh, well. Okay. I would steal faculty from anywhere. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah. a, a job is to bring the absolute best students and faculty together. That's the most important job of a dean is the point, appointment of of, of senior scholars That's right. yes. uh, who can teach the extraordinary people that we're fortunate enough to bring uh, to this university. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's important that we be open to the world in order to do that. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, when you think, think of why this matters, uh, you know, not everything keeps going up. The Americans are doing well in higher education today, but there are many warning signs mm -hmm. in the American higher education system. Yeah. Uh, particularly in the funding and the decreasing funding of public mm. higher education in the United States. Mm -hmm. But the Germans defined higher education for more than a century, from 1810 okay. until about the early 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, and the influence was so broad, you know, Harvard around since the late Ming Dynasty, but it becomes a serious research university only by emulating the German model with the founding of our Graduate School of Arts and Sciences mm. uh, in the 1870s. Mm. Um, and other American universities all follow this model. Uh, you've been to Stanford University probably. Yes, yes. Do you know what the motto of Stanford University is? Well, I think they do a lot with innovation, with, uh, with uh, startups and... Uh, they do today, but that's yeah. not what their... Their, okay. their original motto, still their motto okay. today, mm. is die Luft der Freiheit weht. It's in German. Oh. So most people at Stanford don't know how to pronounce okay. it. It means the wind of freedom blows. I see. And so they are also modeled from their founding yes. uh, on a German experience of what Germ the German experience in higher education. Yes, yes. But this is how things decline too. Mm -hmm. The wind of freedom stopped blowing in Germany with the National Socialist seizure of power 
1933. Okay. The great University of Berlin, the model for all modern universities, is destroyed from within by the Nazis mm -hmm. and then from without by the Second World War. I see. Mm -hmm. And, you know, today every university wants to know where it stands in the global rankings. Yeah. But if we had had global rankings a hundred years ago of the kind that we have today, probably eight of the top ten universities in the world would have been German universities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the other two, in Oxford and Cambridge, yeah. no American universities. I see, I see. But today, very seldom does a German university get into the top 50. Mm. Whereas five Chinese universities are now have risen into the top 50 in many of these, many of these uh, rankings. So it shows you that the world changes, mm -hmm. and it can change actually very fast indeed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so uh, th that's great. I mean, that's good to know the evolution of this uh, modern university system and how that actually, uh, you know, from European to America and now China and. Uh, so, so, so how, how higher education is one of the few industries uh, in which the United States is still the number one now. I mean, you count in the top 50 or top 100, I mean, most of our universities are from the U.S. So, so how, how long you think that, uh, uh, you know, that leading position that U.S. can maintain, but you mentioned some of the problem of, uh, of uh, funding and, uh, and things like that. I mean, I know universities in China also have challenges, like they have produced a large number of graduates, like, uh, like 12 million a year, but then, uh, Jobs are more yeah, difficult. Use, yeah, use and employment is now at about almost 20%, so that, yeah. that's also a big challenge. So what do you think about, uh, uh, you know, the dominance of the, of the un university in the U.S.? I think that's probably one of the core competence because U.S. is, is attract talents from all over the world. And then, you know, most of the Nobel laureates work in the United States. And uh, if the U.S. US universities keep in such a strong position, then they are, they are automatically attracting talents, we're giving the best immigration policy. So, so what do you think that for, for university in Europe, and particularly in China, uh, can, can, can improve, and how, how, how we can really, uh, using your words, maybe if in the future, leading together or develop together, and, uh, and how can we uh, learn from each other? Well, I would say that in my book, uh, the case study that is the biggest warning sign for the American university system yes. is the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, it is just one example of the slow motion defunding of public higher education in the United States over the last several decades. Today, 44 out of 50 American states ha are spending less per student on higher education than they did in real terms in 2008. 44 out of 50 states. Uh, so that's where 80% of American students get their education is in public universities. Mm -hmm. And if these great institutions, Berkeley, Michigan, University of Washington, University of Illinois, these great public institutions decline, I can guarantee you mm -hmm. that the great private institutions, Harvard, Yale, mm. Chicago, Stanford, we will also decline because we compete for the same faculty, the same graduate students, same senior administrators, mm -hmm. and competition in education, like in any business, is the key to excellence. Mm -hmm. And without it, you actually will decline. Mm -hmm. So this is a big warning sign for the United States. <clears throat> I don't believe, you know, I'm not one who believes that one country has to win and another one has to lose in, comp in, in, in any competition, whether it's in business, whether it's in semiconductors, sure, sure, sure. or yeah. in higher education. No country, however, today is investing more in higher education than China. Uh, no country has seen universities rise as rapidly to international recognition mm -hmm. as China. And we think of this as happening overnight, but Chinese universities have a 130-year-old history. To getting back to 1893 and the founding of what is today Wuhan Dashui, mm. the oldest Chinese university, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, founded by Zhang Zhidong mm -hmm. as the self-strengthening institute in I Wuhan. Mm -hmm. And these universities grew through the Nei Qing into the Republican period, the Beiyang period. Mm -hmm. uh, they thrived under the Guomenjangfu mm -hmm. of the nationalist period. They survived the Japanese invasion. They even survived Mao Zedong's cultural revolution, which nearly destroyed mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. in China. Mm -hmm. And today they are back building on a strong foundation of pre-1949 universities, but also taking it to an altogether different level um, in terms of their global capacities. 
And it's one of the things when one thinks about universities, if you look to the long future, you know, everyone worries about what will happen this or next or other year. But universities have to take the long view. Mm -hmm. They survive governments. Mm -hmm. They survive administrations. You know, Harvard has survived. We were founded when this was a colony mm. uh, of Great Britain. Uh, it survived the American Revolutionary War, and indeed part of the war was fought right here. Troops were billeted on the Harvard campus. Uh, the S American Civil War, multiple incarnations, multiple American regimes uh, of uh, governments and administrations over this period of time. Uh, but you have to take the long view as to where you will be. And our long view is that engagement with the rest of the world is essential for the future of Harvard and for American higher education. Mm -hmm. To take a counterexample, and the leading Chinese universities all know this. Mm -hmm. They absolutely know this and they share the values of their counterparts in the United States and in Europe. But recently, three Chinese universities withdrew from global rankings mm. in order to pursue what they called a okay. education with Chinese characteristics. Now, that's not a terrible thing. Of course, every mm -hmm. country has its own characteristics. Um, but that meant that they were no longer also comparing themselves and competing against also the best in the world. That is a, not a good sign, mm -hmm. I think. Isolation, self-isolation, uh, is a basically a death sentence for, for universities anywhere in the world. And if the Americans become isolationist in restricting scholars from coming to the United States, or if Chinese universities no longer are comparing themselves also to the best in the world, uh, then we're all collectively in some trouble. Yeah, the, yeah that, that's, uh, that's a good advice, actually. Uh, you know, you, you have vividly uh, demonstrated how university developed. For example, the American university learned from, uh, you know, Germany and uh, European universities. And then actually also very, very, very true, I mean, the longest running institution is the, in the world. I mean, we haven't heard a company for several hundred years, but we hear about a company, for, a university for several hundred years, which is still going very strong. Harvard is a, is a good example. And also, that's true. I think I really, uh, really highly echo your, 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 your you know, thinking that uh, university has to engage with the world. It has to really <laughs> compare with the world. And then, you know, put into the, uh, in a big global environment, and then let's, let's thrive and let's compete and let's cooperate. So, you know, the, the person who articulated what a great university could be, better than any university president that I've ever yeah, seen, yeah. is um, is the um, Tsai Yuanpei. Yes. Tsai Yuanpei as chancellor of Peking University during the Wu Si Yundong yes. period. Yes, yes. Uh, and he said that students had to have a shi jie guan de jiao yu. Yeah. Uh, a education with a world view. That's correct. He believed, following the German model, and what the Germans call Lehrfreiheit, the freedom to teach, mm -hmm. and Lernfreiheit, the freedom to learn on the part of students. Mm -hmm. And he brought to the Beida campus, you know, great liberal intellectuals like Hu Shi, yeah. but also China's first Marxists yes, right. uh, in academic life, mm -hmm. uh, Chen Dushou, yeah. Li Da Zhao, yeah, yeah. uh, these individuals, so that the students could choose for themselves what to believe yeah. and learn from themselves how to be productive citizens for the new China of the 20th century. That's right. That's right. You have a, a very uh, a deep knowledge on China. And you if you think history, of, yes. think of, of course, uh, what is today Beida's great counterpart in the same city, uh, mm -hmm. Tsinghua. Yeah. Tsinghua University founded mm -hmm. as a prep school to send Chinese to the United States. Yeah. Uh, in 1911, the last mm -hmm. year of the Qing. And today, and I was very fortunate to be the senior advisor uh, to uh, Mr. Stephen Schwartzman yes. and to President Chen Jining okay. of, uh, and, and then President Chou Yong of Tsinghua University in establishing the Su Shu Shuyuan, yes, yes. this global college, a college of global affairs yeah. at Tsinghua, which is bringing the best and the brightest of the world from China and from around the world to Tsinghua University. And it is its aspiration is to be the Rhodes Scholarship of the 21st that's century. Right, that's so when right. you think of, when you think of this, think of the ambition. Mm -hmm. Here's Tsinghua, founded as a place to send Chinese away, mm -hmm. now welcoming the best and the brightest of the world to Beijing, and 
their message is that why would a young student want to have a Rhodes Scholarship? Mm -hmm. Why would you want to study in England, a cold, rainy, foggy, self-isolating island off the coast of Europe, mm -hmm. when you can be in Beijing at the center of this great and global uh, rising power? Mm -hmm. That's the ambition. Yes. Yes. Whether they succeed or not, we shall see. No, no I think you're right. I mean, I, I, I know Schwarzman College very well. My son went there. Okay. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So, so, so uh, the, the Dean Xuelang is a good friend. and uh, uh, Xuelang is a yeah. wonderful, yeah. wonderful So, leader. So we, 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 we actually, uh, I'm a mentor also. I uh, you know, t took interviews for, for them from time to time. Oh, gotcha, uh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, screening the, the applicants. But, but it's real. It's, it's uh, absolutely. Um, you mentioned the Stanford, you mentioned the Harvard, you know, they, they all learn from, you know, the university from, from Germany and, and uh, you know, many, many years ago. And actually, you are right, you know, Tsinghua and even Peking University in Yanjing was also with American yes. uh, uh, model at the beginning. So, so I, I think those are really, uh, that, that you're absolutely correct, the engagement with the world exchanges. And that particularly, uh, you know, the, the learning, leading university exchanges among each other is crucial. And... Uh, and I also attract talents from all over the world, and uh, so that's that part. China is still lacking the, <laughs> the United States for for attracting talents from all over the world, not just diaspora, but really global talents. It's uh, a challenge. It, yeah, it, it is a challenge. challenge, and the yeah. language issues are big. Sure, sure. But it's it's doable. So many courses yeah. are now taught at Tsinghua and Beida, also in English. That's right. Or in other languages. Yes, yes. And so, but it is it is a it is a it is a challenge, but it is uh, it's one that can be mm -hmm. can be overcome. If the flow of ideas yeah. is unimpeded, that's true. Anything that's right. that stops the flow of ideas from one country to another uh, is a source of concern yes. and will lead to academic decline. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think you know, as as a veteran uh, educator, you know, <laughs> experienced uh, uh, in U.S. and China for, for for so many years. So that's really a great. Uh, uh, great, uh, uh, you know, advice you've been providing. So, so I think it would be really give a lot of a, a food for thought at the how a, a good university, how a better education education system, and also how the talent recruiting system can really facilitate uh, the growth of the modern university. Uh, so, so you've been teaching also at the Harvard Business School for some time, yes. and and of course you've been meeting a lot of Chinese students, and also both in China and US. So, so, so Harvard has been really a harbor of, uh, of Chinese students. I mean, for, for, for many years, I mean, a lot of people had a good experience here. Uh, and now the, 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 the traffic between the U.S. and China, I mean, on the student exchange, Chinese students still going in strong. So it's how, how, how do you, uh, uh, you know, feel about a, a university student from China and other international countries too? So how they perform and what's the uh, uh, recipe for Harvard to attract so many international student? I think the, the recipe is really, you know, you have to, in order to, I mean, these students can, who come to Harvard could go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so you have to attract them by being excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just the name. Of course. You know, Harvard is, is a famous name and the reputation of Harvard is greater the farther away you are from mm -hmm. the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yes. But <clears throat> uh, we have our strengths mm -hmm. and like any institution, we also have our have our weaknesses. What is the best thing about, you know, most of the Chinese graduates, the stu most of the Chinese students who come to Harvard come not as undergraduates, although we do have wonderful undergraduates from China, mm -hmm. uh, but mostly in the graduate programs. And there's something about a PhD program, a graduate program that is different from undergraduate college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People are admitted to undergraduate colleges in the United States for all kinds of reasons. You're a good football player. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. Or you're a championship, uh, uh, you know, a fencer. I see. Uh, or you're a, ma you know, a chess wizard. I see. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. But also, you, you, you're, it's very diverse okay. points of view. It's an unusual thing with American higher education. Mm. Uh, so we all pay more attention to the personalities, the traits, and, and their specialty right. and, and talents. We, we've always tried to bring the most diverse class possible I see. Uh, to the campus and have been expanding significantly our outreach to students who cannot have, whose families are not wealthy families uh, for, and for whom we give financial aid mm. uh, very significant. Seventy percent of our undergraduates are on financial aid. Oh, is that right? Okay. At Harvard. You don't have to be rich to come to Harvard. That's our message, oh. but we have to keep repeating it and work at it. Mm. The graduate school is different mm -hmm. because it isn't a central admissions office. Mm -hmm. It is every single department. 
mm. admitting purely on the basis of academic merit and promise. Oh, I see. So it is the most meritocratic part of American higher education. Mm. And that is, and the fact that we have so many Chinese as the largest cohort of any, inter, any international uh, grouping here at our graduate school uh, shows you that the, the, the education that these people are being, have received in China is extraordinary enough that we want to bring that talent also mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And again, if we are restricted, the Trump administration tried to restrict this, mm. but uh, Harvard and other universities resisted. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Biden administration has been very helpful in bringing students over, c providing visas, and so on. What we have to work on now is the other side. Mm. That is, uh, because of zero COVID, That's there are right. almost no, no Americans <laughs> studying in China. Yeah, yeah. Two, there are like 290,000 Chinese studying in the United States and 252 Americans mm, studying in mm, China. Mm. Now that's mostly, it was never going to be a high number, and mm. it, it, as high a number mm. for all kinds of reasons, including language, but also zero COVID policy made it impossible for students to go. Mm -hmm. So this year for the first time, this Harvard China Fund that I oversee, yep. where we've sent 20 plus students to work in internships this summer in China, we have an undergraduate student group that is sending 100 students to work with Chinese high school students this summer. We are trying to bring our students back to China. Uh, we're starting a summer school with Fudan University next mm. summer. Mm. Um, so we are, we are trying, yes. but it's, we have to push hard. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. that's right. I think now because uh, we, we, with the COVID, you know, that China totally open now. Yes. And, um, welcome all the foreigners, a 10 year multiple entry visa, all valid, and then people can apply more visas. Right. And then, you know, all the universities are geared up to welcome right. uh, international students, uh, particularly students from US too. So, so this is really great news. I and mean, you are uh, a, a champion for that. I mean, you also the head of Harvard Shanghai Center, <laughs> and then, then conduct so many activities. So maybe mention a bit about the Harvard Shanghai Center. What, uh, you know, what, what is the purpose and how they can facilitate the exchanges and, and between China and the United States and Harvard, of course. So this center was founded in uh, 2010. It's okay. in Lujiazui mm. uh, in, uh, in, in Shanghai. And it, has, it ho houses a research staff from Harvard Business School working on business school cases. Okay. Uh, it houses faculty and students who come to work in China for periods of time. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we have conferences and workshops uh, either in executive education for the business school or much more commonly today, conferences on, on issues of public health or from uh, Harvard Law School. We have a disability program that has worked very successfully in China, mm. Harvard Kennedy School. Um, the, virtually every school at Harvard University has hosted a program or, or more with our Chinese counterparts mm. at that center. And through our Harvard China Fund, this academic venture fund, we give grants to faculty th who have to work and will work with their Chinese counterparts on issues related to modern China, mm -hmm. of importance to, to modern China, and they give seminars and workshops also at this center. So before COVID, it was very busy. Yes. Last three years, not so busy. No, no, no. So it's our job to restart <laughs> it. Yes. But our mission right now is not just to restart where we are in Shanghai. We are looking also to uh, expand our footprint elsewhere in China, mm -hmm. uh, in Beijing or perhaps in South China. Uh, we don't know yet, sure, it's early, sure, sure. very early days, mm -hmm. uh, but we are trying to give the message that we are not retreating from China. We would like to deepen our relations with China. That's great, that's great. I mean, you can see you, you've been already uh, three times in China <laughs> this year. I mean, we hope to come back more. And uh, uh, now talk about, uh, you know, we talk about so much about University, Harvard, and uh, your, your new book, and, and now I, I'd like to go a little further. And uh, uh, because of, uh, you know, I mean, I was in Harvard, you know, 13 years ago, and then, you know, at that time, there was really a lot of uh, exchanges, and then the Sino-US relation was really in a, in a very good a great, place. Great, great shape. And, uh, and now for the last several years, in particular the last five, six years, we see a decline yes. of China-US relations, and, uh, and you being at this uh, forefront of, of course, uh, uh, teaching, how to do business in China, and uh, of course receiving the uh, the scholars uh, uh, from both China and the U.S. So, so you you you're also an expert on China itself. So, so what what do you think? Uh, what 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 went wrong, and how, how we can 
you know, at least maintain this uh, people-to-people exchange, and then maybe how we can lift from that. I'm glad uh, the Secretary Blinken and Secretary Yellen and uh, Secretary, you know, Cam, you know, these uh, John Kerry and, and even Dr. Kissinger, the 100 years old, yes. <laughs> all yes. went to China. Amazing, yeah. amazing, yeah. Yeah, it's re remarkable. So, so can we really pull this back a little bit and stabilize? I mean, not, uh, of course, we, we, we understand we have to uh, compete, but, but we also have to collaborate. Uh, uh, just like I was talking to uh, uh, your Grand Madison at the Munich Security Conference, and he said we have uh, heard too much about com competition, less about cooperation, and at least we should hear the same amount of uh, cooperation and competition, or even more of cooperation. So, so from from a Chinese uh, top expert, what's your over assessment, and and where are the future we can we can work together? Well, uh, it is a very worrisome trend because I think you have, in some sense. You know, something, there are certain outcomes that come from domestic politics in both countries. Yeah. Uh, under President Xi, China uh, moved rather significantly, when you say in political terms, to the left. Mm -hmm. And under President Trump, America moved significantly to the right and maybe over the edge mm. of yeah. the right. In, um, and you have a kind of a mutual suspicion, a mutual paranoia, yeah. which is not a good environment for sound policy making. Mm -hmm. uh, and both countries have taken, I fear, rather too, uh, too, too short-term a view yeah. toward their strategic relationship because both th this relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in the world today. Yeah. Um, and I fear that both are managing the day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, and even year-to-year -year relationship, but the kind of strategic vision, for example, that Kissinger had in, in his day <coughs> Uh, it's difficult to see that from either side, yes. quite frankly, yes. at the present. Where do we think this relationship is going? China will be here forever. Mm. The United States has been around for as, not quite as long as the Qing dynasty. No. Uh, <laughs> but but it, is, it, it has, I think, a very, very promising future. Yes. These two countries have enormous issues to solve, mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me, including climate change. Yes. Look at what has happened in both countries. This summer, mm -hmm. the horrific oh, heat wave, yeah. Oh, yeah. and now this Paris. terrible flooding in Beijing, yeah. and so on. Really unexpected uh, turbulence of a natural sort, but also in part man-made. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are the two greatest polluters in the world. Yeah. What is their collective responsibility? So far, neither side has stepped up mm -hmm. to the degree that is. How do they solve you know, the biggest strategic issue of East Asia, which, in my view, is not the Taiwan question, yes. which, you know, history has shown that that question may not need to be re resolved in a fundamental way for people to cooperate and to thrive uh, across the Taiwan Strait. Yeah. Uh, but I worry deeply about the situation in Korea, in North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, think of this, and this is something that I don't hear my Chinese friends worrying about, or the American side, quite mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. You know, if North Korea continues to have nuclear weapons. Yeah. So, you know, from a Chinese point of view, you know, I sometimes joke that the greatest strategic danger for China is uh, nuclear weapons in North Korea because you don't know where one of their missiles might land. Mm. And you're closer than anybody else. That's right. But yeah. that's the, if they continue to have nuclear weapons, inevitably South Korea will have them. South Korea has them, Japan will have them, mm. Taiwan could have them. This is a disaster geopolitically for China. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a long-term strategic view of both the United States and China, how do they work together to establish, you know, a more stable situation on the Korean Peninsula? A stable situation that is stable enough that at some point the American troops go home mm -hmm. uh, from the South. Uh, but this is, it's that, you know, I, I don't know what the solution ought to be, uh, but it's that lack of long-term thinking that really does, right now we're both managing that, assuming that worse things cannot happen, but I can guarantee you worse things can happen yeah, yeah. than where we are today. Yeah, no, no, no thank you. you. You have some uh, very uh, uh, unique, actually, insightful views on this. I think that that's true, you know, because uh, uh, China has been uh, 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 growing and uh, developing and, and, and then for its uh, open door policy and also of its embrace the globalization, WTO and all that. And particularly the, the exchanges with the world, so China now becomes second largest economy of the of the world, and then China has been 
um, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, also the largest trading nation is 140 countries and, yes. and they contribute over one third of a global GDP. So I'm thinking, you know, the, the U.S. used to have a view, okay, uh, China, we, we support you join the WTO and then you could uh, converge, you become, okay, similar to, to our, our, our system. But as you said, China is a big country, 5,000 years history and its own uh, cultural characteristic. And U.S. is a big country <laughs> with, uh, with a very, uh, you know, uh, the largest economy in the world. So, so the cool two countries probably could not converge each other. Maybe, but then we will see how we can work together and, and coexist peacefully. So this probably takes some time. I mean, I remember last time when I was talking to Joseph Nye, he was telling me, uh, maybe, you know, by 2035 or 2040, you know, another 10, 15 years, we may have another cycle of, uh, of coming back and a new equilibrium. I remember I talked to I many, 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 many Harvard professors, even uh, including Tony Satt. He, he has received so many uh, Chinese visitors uh, yes. in his capacity. You know, it, uh, no, no Harvard professor I talked to have actually, uh, 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 you know, in favor of uh, decoupling. And now we're talking about the risk, but, but also, <laughs> Uh, uh, and then no, nobody really wants to have the Cold War. I mean, even uh, Graham, Lee, Graham Bellings has warned on that, which you'll find a way to escape uh, his, his trap. So, so I think, you know, uh, so I think this, uh, this visit of high senior officials of, uh, to China and then probably Chinese visit to U.S. Uh, could, could help to have a better understanding. And I also hope that uh, at G20, uh, President Xi, President Biden, or even at the APEC summit, you know, they can, they can really uh, meet again, uh, 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 maybe uh, for twice, so so that we can try to find uh, 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 some stabilizing factor. So, so so w one of the questions I have is that uh, uh, if if we can have a, a, a more uh, uh, you know a multilateral system or some kind of a, a coexisting formula, and uh, and then uh, to both U.S. and China can really uh, uh, accept each other. Uh, because uh, because this, this binary view of uh, autocracy and democracy may not working because China does have a different uh, uh, system there. So uh, so so what do you think about uh, in the long run how how we can peacefully uh, coexist? Because I see this uh, this talent you know student exchange is still very strong, uh, trade is very strong. Last year they have actually built break the record China U.S. Uh, trade numbers, and uh, again yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. then again I know a lot of companies are not happy. For example. 70% of Chinese uh, energy depends on the import. China spend more to import chips than energy. And then if this, uh, this chips act or chips ban on, on selling uh, high-end chips to China, that billion of billions of losses, trillions yes. for the US companies. And then they are, I mean, the argument they have, they cannot support R&D without China <laughs> buying that. I mean, the reason Taiwan, South Korea, Japan become the largest uh, uh, chip makers because they're close to China and they sell to China. And China can also subcontract in many of those uh, manufacturing. So, so this kind of a, a, a decoupling or, or de-risk uh, model is is not really productive. And you are the business professor, so <laughs> what do you think about how we can really co co work together and in in the twenty first century? Well, I think it's I think it's very important to focus on those areas where we must work together. Yeah, uh, and and th then on those areas where we absolutely can work together. So the, you have a kind of, a, a, as I said, a, this mutual paranoia, the fear that each side has a deep hatched plot mm -hmm. uh, that will be to the detriment of the other side. This is in the political elites of both countries, not so much in the general population. Mm -hmm. And public opinion is very malleable. You know, 60% of Americans had a positive view of China before Trump was president. Mm. Now it's 80% negative. The damage that his administration did in this area is really incalculable. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, but I think you know if you look again, if you look at one area, the Chips Act in the United States, uh, the United States has a foreign policy uh, too easily defined by sanctions mm -hmm. uh, rather than by incentives. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and China has a foreign policy not by sanctions, but China has managed over the last five to eight years to antagonize almost all of its East Asian neighbors rather than being the big brother uh, of its East Asian neighbors. Uh, its relations with many of its East Asian neighbors are worse uh, than they were uh, 10 or more years ago. And, that's, and that drives them more toward seeking help from the United States. Uh, 
So it is, um, you have a kind of mutually reinforcing uh, set, of, set of affairs. But I think from the point of view of business, right now we're in a situation in which, you know, things are going a little bit fripped. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Chinese uh, governments, local governments, pr provincial, mm -hmm. municipal governments, are welcoming foreign business back into China yes. uh, in an aggressive way. Uh, and if you're an American company doing business in China today, your b biggest political risk doesn't come from Beijing, mm. it comes from Washington, yeah. because you don't know where the next set of regulations can be. And so my personal view is that in, m in multiple areas, in technology as in other areas, but as in education, it isn't true that one side has to, one side has to win and another side has to lose. Who, after all, is the leader in the world of semiconductors? It's a company, not a country. It's mm. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, mm. an extraordinary company uh, built with government support in the 1980s, but it was private initiative and entrepreneurship on the part of Morris Chang mm -hmm. and others, now his successor, Mark Liu, uh, have made this a company without peer in the world of, of semiconductors. They invest in mainland China. They invest now in the United States. They are a truly global company that is based in Taiwan. And yet both sides, and particularly the American side most recently, have kind of restricted the kind of freedom of you know, market considerations uh, for that company in deciding where next and possibly to invest. Hence this large investment uh, in Arizona. And at the end of the day, the United States, which today produces about 12% of its high-end uh, microprocessors, will end up producing 15% no. of its microprocessors in the United States. Yes. Will that make us feel more secure? I don't quite get the policy. I, mm -hmm. uh, I think it does have some real strengths, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, TSMC has to play the geopolitical risk of uh, appeasing the Americans while also maintaining mm -hmm. uh, their contacts throughout the world, including uh, in, 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 in mainland China. Yes, yes. Um, as, you know, Morris Chang is one of the most remarkable business people I've ever met. I've done three or four business school cases on TSMC. Oh, good, good, yes. And, you know, he was a Harvard freshman. Oh, I see, okay. And when he was here as a freshman, uh, he, he, was a, he came to love English literature, mm. and he wanted to be an English major. I see. And when his father, when he told his father that he wanted to be an English major, his father forced him to transfer down the river to MIT to oh, get a real education okay, in see. engineering. Okay. That worked out very well. Okay. Uh, but he is, you know, a remarkable, remarkable talent and has built this company that is, at some sense, its geopolitical risk. If, if, the, if the Americans and the Chinese really care about this global economy, they should care significantly about the prosperity of a country company that has no peer mm -hmm. in the high-end world of semiconductors. That, that's right. <laughs> I think you, you, you cited this good uh, example of, uh, you know, uh, this uh, Morris Chan. Uh, he, he does make the huge uh, uh, contributions to the to global uh, high-tech industry, and uh, particularly this, this case of, uh, you know, this uh, company that he founded, TSMC, is, is, is remarkable. And, and also, of course, is a, is a, is a uh, you know, uh, uh, Chinese in Taiwan who has actually built this, uh, uh, you know, very uh, reputable global uh, market. But I think also it's thrived together with the Asian market and global market. Of course. And uh, so, so now they want to cut off the biggest market. Uh, you know, China buys 30, 40 percent of uh, 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 semiconductors worldwide, and then that that is really hurting all those uh, bottom lines of all the companies. So, so the policy may not be wise. I'm, 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 I'm. I'm Expecting, you know, Secretary Raimondo is visiting China yes. this month, and hopefully, you know, we could get some more uh, clarification as to, you know, how many things they can uh, can 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 lift or stop. For example, there's a 1,300 companies or individuals are on American entity or sanction list. Know. <laughs> you know, and maybe there's a few from China too, but but it's really uh, incompatible. Maybe we could stop that or lift some of that, and uh, and uh, you know that. Uh, uh, even this defense minister could be lifted so that he can he can talk to the U.S. defense minister of course, or, of or the Hong Kong si chi chief exec can be lifted so he can attend the APEC summit. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things that... No, these, the, these, these, uh, yeah. when, 
it's it's an interesting it's it, it has yeah. really gotten more than a little bit out of hand that's right uh, sanctions are what you do when you have no you you want to show an opinion yeah uh, and have some influence but the number of cases where international sanctions have actually achieved their purpose is very few. Yeah, yeah. Uh, South Africa under apartheid is one example mm -hmm. of eventually achieving something. Sure. But look at the American sanctions on Cuba, which began in 1960. Mm. How successful have they been? That's right. So it, it's it's very counterproductive. Mm -hmm. uh, another example is I know there's a, there's a there's a research lab which plays a key role in stop fentanyl coming to the United States. But that has been under sanctions, so it basically uh, I, that did, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah discourage them and uh, and uh, 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 you know prioritize them for doing more. So, so, so I think you know we should probably abandon this kind of uh, uh, keep sanction on each other. Well, you know, one one company that I've studied uh, very well uh, is one of the greatest uh, apparel makers in the world, the shirt maker. Mm. Uh, it's called Eskel. It's headquartered in Hong Kong, but it produces in China. Yeah, uh, and it, at its height, it made a more than half of the high-end men's cotton woven shirts in the world mm. and made from excellent Xinjiang cotton, oh, uh, buying okay. cotton from Uyghur farmers okay. uh, in Xinjiang. But they were accused, quite wrongly in my view, mm -hmm. a very poor bit of research, they were accused by uh, some, uh, some nonprofit of using forced labor mm. uh, in Xinjiang, mm. uh, which they deny. Yeah. I've actually been to the plant okay. uh, that they were accused of, which is almost entirely automated. So I think it is a mistake. Yes. Uh, but they have invited, in so they they want to get off this entity list. They're on the entity list. Yes. They've lost many markets uh, around the world because mm -hmm. of it. Uh, and they are would welcome international visitors to come and, and look at the facilities and to judge for themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then the Chinese side won't let the international visitors come and look. Oh, yeah. So they're oh, caught between oh, yeah. That's right. That's the right. global tensions between China. Yeah. Yeah. And the United States. Yeah, we should have more visitors. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think Xinjiang should, you know, probably they're welcoming <laughs> all the visitors. We know there's some ambassadors going, some journalists, but we should, you know, welcome even more so that uh, some myth and some uh, misunderstanding uh, uh, and interpretation can be clarified. But I know that, uh, uh, you know, we, we know that Chinese companies. Uh, uh, sometimes also have a hard time in the in the U.S. You, you are the business professor, for example. This by dance has been the CEO has been grilled at, uh, at uh, six hours in the Congress, and then they were worried about uh, this. Uh, you know, TikTok has some uh, national security issues. But I, sometimes I was wondering. I mean, we talk about Taiwanese uh, companies. I know we know that uh, the uh, Apple and Jerry Go, uh, Foxconn. Yeah. You know, Apple produced ninety. More than 90% of its uh, old gadgets, phone, you know, iPad and computer, everything in China. And then there's no national security issue. <laughs> I mean, for, for I know. you know, yeah. but then, so, so probably we should not paranoia of, of, of really suspect each other so much that we really should, should trust, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the industry, as you said. I mean, the industry really, you know, uh, what's, what's the best. And then they are, they are going to stick to the, to the rules and, and, and the regulations. China also uh, actually means of foreign affairs has, has put put a proposal of uh, eight point of a data uh, initiative, uh, which says any company operating in the foreign countries from China, they are they are, they are not uh, required or they, are, they should not report their data back to the Chinese government. You know, if if Chinese one government wants to have it, they should talk to the government of the other countries. So so there's there's rules regulations there, but then. You know, a lot of the communication has not been there, and and people just see some uh, headlines and news. Well, TikTok is one of these great examples. You know, yes, yes. Just imagine the two uh, greatest countries in the world today. Yeah. Having a dispute over a teenage video app. That's right. As there, as one of the central areas of of confrontation. It's absolutely insane. Yes. Uh, and the, you know, of course, TikTok is extraordinarily popular, extraordinarily popular yeah. in the United States, and so. I think it was the several states, I forget which one, Montana, yeah. has forbade TikTok to be shown in, or used in schools or in other things. Mm. Uh, public officials, you know, in different state governments have been told that they can't have a, make a TikTok or, mm -hmm. you know. These people, of course, have no idea how to do it anyway. That's right. They're, <laughs> they're too old. <laughs> yes. You have to be young and imaginative yes. in order to, to, uh, to do well with that. that app. But I, but I you know, I think Chinese, I think this is this is an area where I, here is where I would hope that we could see some real progress in coming years. Mm. More Chinese private companies investing in the United States, because many would like to. Yeah. Obviously, 
you know, who's the leader of battery technology? Yeah. It's China, yeah. right? Uh, CATL, BYD, others in China. Uh, uh, Ford, with its uh, uh, licensing ag agreement with yeah. CATL, is, mm -hmm. this is a very important step. If the Americans are going to move toward electric vehicles, we have to work closely with China yeah. in order to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and we should be welcoming Chinese automobile manufacturers doing EVs and others yep. in the United States. You know, but I can guarantee you that uh, if it were possible politically, any mayor or governor of any state in the United States would welcome Chinese investment mm -hmm. in it. Uh, let me give you one example uh, of a company that I know very well because it was one of my very first business school case okay. was on Wanchang. Oh, Wanchang, yes. Uh, no, Wan, uh, Wanchang in Mr. Han, Lee, Mr. Uh, you know, Mr. Uh, yeah, Mr. Lee, but now it was, you know, it was um, Lu Guanzhou. Okay. Lu Guanzhou is the father. The founder. Yeah. Yeah. Founded this company in 1969 mm. at the height of the Cultural Revolution. The worst year in Chinese history to found a company, I think. Yes. Just yes, about. Yes. Yes. But he eventually starts to make universal joints for trucks and cars, gets into the state plan 10 years later now the largest auto components manufacturer in China, which is the largest automobile manufacturing country in the world. Mm -hmm. But he invests, and his son-in-law, Ni Pin. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Ni. Yeah. Uh, here in Chicago, they invest in the United States in a dying industry, yeah. auto parts, in the first decade of, the, of this century, mm -hmm. when this industry is going downhill. Uh, and they, they help to revive a number of companies, save tens of thousands of jobs, mm -hmm. uh, and also learn how to improve their own product back home, back home are extraordinarily profitable. Uh, they now are making a, a hybrid sports car in California. Oh. Um, uh, and, you know, when Lu Guanzhou passed away about three years ago mm. in Hangzhou, he had a memorial service in Hangzhou uh, there were memorials for him in Beijing, and there was a very large memorial for him in Chicago. Oh. Uh, overseen by the governor of Illinois hmm. and the mayor of Chicago. Two people who mostly didn't agree on anything. That's right. <laughs> they agreed that they wanted to honor uh, Mr. Lu, yeah. Mr. Lu yeah. uh, who had invested so much in the upper Midwestern economy mm -hmm. uh, and whose company, Wan Chang, had become a great corporate citizen. Mm -hmm. This is a model that other Chinese companies can follow. It's not easy, yeah. but the opportunities are here. Yeah. Uh, if the geopolitics can recede a bit and allow business to proceed on business terms. Yeah, yeah, that, that's precisely the the, uh, the great point that you've been raising. I think there's uh, there's many uh, state uh, at, the, at the local gov level, at the municipality level. I mean, you know, if in the in the old days they would really continue to help. But also, they, they, now we, we need to really boost the U.S. economy, and also China wants to go in global. And, and then I, I see this area, and particularly in the, with, with the pressure of the climate change. I mean, the clean uh, technology that China already developed. I mean, uh, EV car is the already the biggest uh, manufacturing in the world now. And, uh, and you can see Elon Musk, how successful he's in China. Uh, half of his EV car yeah. produced in China. Yeah. And now he become the richest man in the world. And then you have uh, also, uh, uh, you know, KTL, you mentioned that they're they working with uh, Ford now. And then they are the biggest battery manufacturing in the world. And then you have uh, also, we, I'm a personal friend of uh, Mr. Chao De Wang of Fuyao Glass. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, no, he, yes. he actually very opened his uh, uh, yes, big very, factory very in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Ohio, in, in, you know, uh, uh, which I think President Ob Obama even participating in his documentary in right. American Factory. And, <laughs> and many people like that, and, and of course, BA, you know, BRD, BYD is, is also doing you know, So this China is leading in the wind power, solar power, and electric power, and, and battery power. I mean, we're facing this uh, climate change, and we want to, as two largest emitters in the world, I mean, <laughs> China is even larger. So we can actually have many things to work between Chinese companies, U.S., uh, local governments and U.S. business and Chinese local governments too. So, so I think we have brilliant example. You mentioned about Lu Wanchou in, in Chicago. We have Elon Musk in Shanghai. Those are really perfect examples. We should have more of that. So, so I really think that I, I agree. I noticed the administration now talking about uh, small yard hand fans. Uh, that yard really wants to be smaller and smaller, and then really uh, all largely uh, <laughs> like Yellen, <laughs> Je <coughs> Yellen has saying all the large uh, business should continue. So we, we should really do that. So, so uh, I really agree uh, what, what you just mentioned.
Well, you know, there's, on energy policy, both countries have different approaches. Of course, the rhetoric is all about clean energy yes. on the Biden administration and from President Xi and, and, yeah. and his team. And yet the reality is that China is the leader in clean energy, but it's also building more coal-fired power plants mm -hmm. every day than yeah. any place in the world yeah, 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 yeah. Um, for energy security. Yes, yes, yes. And here you have in the United States, you have many people on the uh, more liberal or left side of the political spectrum seeking more and more green energy. Yeah. Uh, and yet many people on the Republican side in particular think we need to reinvest more in oil and gas and mm -hmm. so on for also mm -hmm. for energy mm -hmm. security. So you have conflicting views in both countries yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. conflicting realities. Yeah, yeah. I think we should, we should uh, you know, really have more. I, I hope that this COP28, but also I also hope that uh, the, the recent visit of John Kerry, that, you know, we could yes. reach some more understanding. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that uh, China already announced they're not going to build the coal fire plant outside uh, China or, or Belt and Road countries. But I think domestically, there, there are some balancing issues. But I think eventually, as they develop this clean, clean, clean technology, they, they should really gradually phase out all those coal fire. So that's, that's uh, really... Uh, important for, yeah, for it, China. It would yeah. be a major challenge. Yes, major yes. Challenge. So, so now maybe we, we come to our last part of our uh, discussion. Uh, I know that uh, you travel a lot internationally, and and, then, and of course, U.S. China is uh, is now at every conference, at every forum, <laughs> and be, be become the deep subject of, of the many of the discussions. And uh, I, I know that recently, you know, I mean, recent two years, we have this. Uh, is war on, on, on Ukraine. I mean, uh, I mean, I even wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in the last last uh, you know, last year in March when the war broke out. You know, we said China should play some, you know, positive role, mediating role, or, or, or promoting the peace and, and, and talks. And I would do see China's government pro pro propose twelve-point uh, peace position paper on that. Yes. So now, with this war still drags on, it's still also very dangerous now. I mean, U.S. is uh, is uh, is absolutely also. Uh, involved with NATO and and uh, support and so how do you see this uh, prospect I and mean, how China and U.S. can work together? I mean, EU also is very very important. So is there a possibility that uh, U.S., EU, and China we have a have a trilateral uh, uh, you know uh, mechanism that really works on this uh, uh, issue with UN with uh, with maybe have as I, I said that uh, New York Times up and maybe we could have a seven party talk you know P five plus EU plus Ukraine. And uh, so, so this is really, I mean, in many, many p p minds of European countries, and of course, uh, American too. China wants to see uh, the, 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 the peaceful end of this uh, conflict. And then, you know, China doesn't really side it with, uh, with Russia. I mean, <laughs> of course, China wants to probably some neutral position. But then in order to really convince both uh, Russia and Ukraine, China couldn't be 100% position as as U.S. or EU. No, no, sure. Yeah. So, so, so on this, I don't know if you have any. I, I do have. I do yeah. have views on it. Sure, I sure, think, sure. You know, countries sometimes, you know, and the United States. Our recent history is full of major foreign policy mistakes mm -hmm. or foreign policy errors. Yeah. Look at you know, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, these are, you know own goals, as one would say, in the world of soccer. Yes, in yes. In the world of football, really. Yeah, yeah. But at a great cost to the country in, uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and at a cost to those countries. I think major, major foreign policy uh, mistakes. I fear that the you know, alignment of uh, China with Russia during the Winter Olympics uh, of 2022 yeah. is also such an occasion, um, mm -hmm. given the long history of Chinese-Soviet relations, the very up and down history of Chinese-Soviet relations. Mm, yeah. Um, but it was absolutely to the detriment of China's relationship with Europe. Yeah. Because China, you know, uh, two weeks after Mr. Putin uh, visited President Xi, yeah. uh, a war breaks out. Mm -hmm. And people have to believe that the Chinese side gave the Russia a blank check mm. to do what it wished. They, they, not that they could stop it, but surely Mr. Putin will have told them what might happen. The most famous blank check in diplomatic history was that that Germany gave Austria in 1914. Mm. Uh, Serbia is a troublesome neighbor. Go ahead and deal with Serbia uh, after uh, the events of June of 1914. And this blank check unleashes World War One. Mm. 
Blank checks are very expensive to cash, mm -hmm. as it mm -hmm. turns out. Uh, two years later, the German general leading the war, a gentleman named Ludendorff, writes to a friend about Austria, Germany's ally. And he says, we are allied to a corpse. Mm. And Austria, a little bit like Russia today, a great and ancient empire that is having difficulty holding on to its periphery. And sometimes in the decline of empires in, in world history, that is when they are most dangerous. And here you see, from one point of view at least, Mr. Putin seeking to regain territory that had been formerly part of the Soviet Union by invading a sovereign country that China recognizes as a sovereign country. Mm -hmm. So China is now in a very difficult position mm. because it believes in the sanctity of borders. It believes in national self-determination. It, it believes in the Charter of the United Nations yeah. on the sanctity of borders. Uh, it believes that countries should not interfere in each other's internal affairs. And yet it has tacitly, but not explicitly, backed the, the Russian side in this. But it has come at enormous cost of China's relations with Europe. Mm -hmm. Because a war has been unleashed on the doorstep of Europe mm. for the first time in a large scale since World War II. So this is a heavy responsibility on the Chinese side, in my view. And so perhaps with that responsibility uh, comes the authority to actually then do something mm. significant. I think China could be. Yeah. a broker yeah. uh, of peace in this war. I think the Ukrainians have maintained very professional relations with China, and China has maintained professional relations with Ukraine. Uh, it will have a greater influence possibly on the Russian side than any other country, yeah. um, almost surely mm. than any other country, if one is to bring this bloodshed to an end in a way that both stops the aggression, stops the killing uh, uh, leads, I hope, to a withdrawal, but also to whatever security c uh, needs that need to be addressed on the Russian side, mm -hmm. uh, which have not been particularly well articulated. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it is, um, but it is, it is a terribly damaging uh, war. Of course, most damaging at all, of all to Ukraine, where you see yeah. these beautiful yeah. cities being attacked, civilians being killed. Mm -hmm. uh, for reasons uh, that really harken back to a war that happened more than a hundred years ago. Yeah, no, that's uh, it's very mm -hmm. unfortunate, very very tragic, and uh, and and it shocked the whole world. I mean, we we haven't seen any war broke out in the in the last uh, seventy seven years in the, after the Second World War on the European continent, and this is probably the largest scale war that we ever ever seen in the modern modern human beings, and uh, and that's really. You know, and also the modern war that you showed on the television set every day and on the social media, that's, that's really affect everybody. And uh, so... And you think of it from where... where yeah. You know, China today is, in, in my view, mm. the best strategic position of its modern history. Yeah. There is no country that actually threatens China's borders today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, certainly not Russia, not Japan, not mm -hmm. Taiwan, not mm -hmm. Vietnam, not mm -hmm. India, mm -hmm. although there are tense relations with many of these. No one threatens China's borders yeah. mm -hmm. uh, today. And China has prospered because we are today, from 1979, the end of the uh, battles with Vietnam, Chinese-Vietnam mm -hmm. War, in 1979, we are in the longest period of peace in East Asia since the Opium War. Yeah. That peace is the precondition mm -hmm. of prosperity. Mm. That peace allows for investment from the outside into China. Yeah. It allows for Chinese entrepreneurs to have confidence in their future. Yeah. It allows for Chinese governments to invest in the future of their country and in the infrastructure that has helped make China so strong today. Mm -hmm. Peace is the precondition of prosperity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and anything that endangers peace endangers everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is, and this is why talk of war, wherever it is, whether it's in Korea, in Taiwan Strait, anywhere, uh, is dangerous. Uh, because it increases the possibility yeah. simply to talk about it and to prepare for it. Um, uh, uh, the great diplomatic historian, British historian, A.J.P. Taylor, yeah. once said, war is never inevitable mm. until it breaks out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it does, then you do not know what the consequences will be. That's right. It, it, it's, it's so <laughs> devastating. And, and, of course, uh, you know, modern life, I mean, 
uh, I mean, the, the current generation, nobody experienced war. I mean, probably their, 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 their grandfathers or mothers. I was uh, visiting the European Union uh, in May uh, with one of the senior officials, and then they were sitting a row of uh, senior officials of European uh, Commission on the opposite side, and the head of the table he said, look, uh, we, our, our ancestors, our grandfather, all from different countries. We used to fight, but now we're sitting at one table. Uh, so, so European Union, I mean, we see a war broke out there is really, uh, on their border is really dangerous. And, and absolutely, China, uh, as you said, probably enjoying the peace time uh, that they've seen in the last 75 years because China has 4,000 kilometers border with Russia. Yeah. And, you know, used to be a big uh, you know, warrior yeah. for China also, you know. And uh, so, so absolutely right. Now China, you know, Russia depends quite heavily now on, on economic uh, trade with China. Well, I think China is in a good position. China also the largest uh, trading partner with Ukraine. Yes. And also yes. after the war, China could be the largest reconstruction of Ukraine as well. Absolutely. Uh, uh, reconstructor. And uh, so it would be the best use of Belt and Road. That's right. Imaginable. That's right. But also, Ukraine is a signing country to the Belt and Road uh, ah, as well. Right. So, 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 so I think there could be a way that uh, U.S., EU, China can can talk together and then bring Russia and bring Ukraine to the table. And then if China is there, I mean, both sides will say, okay, we, we because China is here, is a, is a neutral party, we are willing to uh, compromise and uh, and do something. So at least we should start some process. And and absolutely, I think. Uh, it's important that uh, this 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 soft power China recently is, is more and more having, after breaking the deal with the Iran Iran and Af Saudis. Yep, it's it's getting there, and uh, and uh, yep. hopefully uh, we could better use that, and yeah yeah yeah, the vice is really important. So so Bill, at the, you know last time I imagine we were at, uh, we were attending the uh, advisor board meeting for Duke uh, Queensland University. Yes 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 yes. <laughs> indeed. Really, yes. Uh, we are both sitting on that advisory board. But uh, but I want to conclude because we are today at Harvard, at the heart of Harvard, the largest uh, Harvard library uh, of the U.S. Uh, campus. Uh, so so Harvard has a long tradition with China. We we'll talk a bit about that. But that, I, I know that. Uh, uh, there are still many, many uh, schools here at Harvard. You know, like we know you are at Harvard Business School, uh, but you used to also be the dean of the uh, Arts and Humanity uh, faculty. And we have a Fairback Center, we have a Yanjing Center, we have a Harvard Yanjing Institute, uh, yeah. Institute, we have Harvard Kennedy School, and Design School, Education School. So, so it seems there's a lot of uh, bonds and connections that China has. And also, you, you talk about the stone. Uh, 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 that who says donated here? I, I saw that is 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 really very uh, noticeable. So so maybe we want to conclude as to, uh, and also including uh, the Shanghai Center that Harvard has only uh, outside uh, the campus in the world. So as a, as a China, uh, uh, you know China U.S. you know academic changes, particularly Harvard and China, you are the leading uh, uh, figure for that. Maybe we can uh, you know conclude on the. On further exchanges, and also, what about those activities of different schools? That uh, are they still very active, or how can they do more? I mean, in the future, yeah. they they have remained as active as possible, happily, thanks to Zoom and other yes, things over yes. the course of zero COVID. Our school of public health worked very strongly with Chinese yeah, also, counterparts. Yeah, yeah, Ronnie in, Chan uh, during, uh, yeah, yeah. donated uh, <laughs> the school. So uh, Gerald and Ronnie Chan yes, both uh, of them, named yeah. the school for their father. Yeah, uh, the uh, T. H. Chang School uh, of Public Health here at Harvard. That's right. Uh, but our our, our colleague uh, Winnie Yip, who mm. runs uh, the China program there, mm. is extraordinarily active. She's in China, I believe, right now. Oh, great! Uh, working on issues of public health, both in rural areas, which is her specialty, mm -hmm. but also that school worked closely with Chinese counterparts in the first years of COVID oh. uh, on dealing. Uh, with the public health, you know, response mm -hmm. in China and elsewhere mm -hmm. uh, to the COVID epidemic, uh, pandemic, uh, our you know, our school of design has worked extraordinarily well with local governments as well as with firms on uh, design issues and urban planning in modern China. Actually, for more than a century, mm -hmm. uh, in different we have city plans that go back. Uh, I once wrote an essay about how Nanjing became the capital in 1927, oh, is that right? and we have the city, pl the original city plan uh, for Nanjing as the capital. Yes, it would have been a beautiful, and it was a beautiful capital. Um, still a beautiful city today. Uh, 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 so every school of of Harvard has mm -hmm. an engagement with with China that's very very important. Yes, uh, and every school wants to continue. Our school of education, mm -hmm. uh, we have wonderful Chinese graduate students who come mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. on a very frequent basis. And right now I'm editing a, a volume about innovation in higher education with my colleague Howard Gardner oh. of the School of Education. Uh, uh, and of course, a number of these case studies of innovation are to be found in China mm -hmm. uh, today. So, you know, we have, we have, you know, so much to look forward to. Yes. Uh, Harvard Yenjing Institute, founded in the late 1920s, yeah. has brought to Harvard so many generations of talent mm -hmm. from China to Harvard mm -hmm. who have made a big impact here at Harvard and then returned to make an even bigger impact, we hope, mm -hmm. back in China. And the reason I'm so passionate about re-engaging and deepening our commitment is this. I was a student of John Fairbank. Okay, I see. Fei Zhengqing Jiao Shou. Yes. John Fairbank learned his Chinese history at Tsinghua University mm. in the 1930s. He was a student yes. of Jiang Tingfu, yes. uh, the great historian who was educated on a boxer indemnity scholarship yeah. at Obergen and at Columbia, became chairman of the history department at Tsinghua. And Fairbank was served in the consulate, uh, in, in the embassy in, oh. in Chongqing during the war, oh. came back to start China programs here. He had a strong s sense of academic collaboration from the 1930s, 40s, into the early 50s. And then it was cut off by the Korean War hmm. on both sides. Yeah. And it would not restart until the early 1970s. Mm -hmm. And he said one of his biggest regrets in life to me once mm. was the cutting off of these academic friendships and relations mm. with Chinese universities and Chinese scholars. I see. And he, you know, he, uh, he said this with great regret in the 1970s. I would say that we are determined that that not happen again. No. Mm -hmm. uh, we share, you know, broadly speaking, the same values as our Chinese counterparts for political reasons, there are difficulties on both sides in acting upon those values at times. Mm -hmm. But in the year 2013, Chinese university presidents from the C9 group, the, yeah. the nine leading universities, signed with the American Association of Research Universities, the British, I think, Russell Group, the Australian Group of Eight, a series of principles mm -hmm. about what are universities for. They are for freedom of research and teaching. Yeah. They are for academic autonomy uh, and, and self-governance, and they are for the creation of knowledge in an unfettered environment. And this reminds me of a very famous phrase at Tsinghua University. Mm -hmm. you know, there was a scholar named Wang Guowei mm -hmm. who committed suicide in 1927 for political protest against the yes. nationalists. Yes. And his colleague, uh, Chen Yingke, mm -hmm. wrote uh, a memorial to him saying that his was a li zhi zhi shen, zi you zhi si xiang, a spirit independent and a mind unfettered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those are the values mm -hmm. held dear at Tsinghua University. Those are the ones that we hold dear here at Harvard. And we need to act on them uh, to the highest degree possible to increase our mutual understanding and our cooperation. Yes, yes, that's uh, really a great, uh, uh, you know, recall of all those uh, uh, historical inspirations and, and moving stories, and also, of course, still uh, inspire us to uh, continue. And I remember when I, when I was here, uh, I spent a year at Harvard Kennedy School as a senior fellow, and uh, it was really a lot of, a lot of uh, learning. I mean, the, 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 the campus here, the, the, the exchanges, and, and also the attitudes to welcome Chinese students was, was enormous. And I remember d during that time, uh, same time uh, with me, uh, was uh, Pan Gong Sim. He was uh, one of the fellow. Now he's the governor, just promoted the governor of People's Bank of China. This is wonderful. Yeah, he was a new, new war fellow at that time we were together. And then there's another new war fellow, Mr. Wang Zhongwei, now become the governor of Guangdong province. So you can see how, how Harvard has... Uh, <laughs> has well, a, I see, you know, and one, <laughs> one person I... Yeah. came to know very well in working on this uh, Schwartzman yes. College. Yes. Schwartzman Shu Yuan was uh, President Chen Jining. Yes. And I, I visited him in Shanghai recently. Yes, yes. yes. Now that he is... Uh, the party, party secretary party there. Secretary okay. Shanghai. Yeah, yeah. And I, he, is, he was, I think, the most amazing university president, one of the most amazing yeah, yeah, he got his pitch that I have ever met UK, yes. from the UK. Yes, yes. Extraordinarily talented, mm -hmm. uh, remarkable man, yeah. uh, assisted this program, but he brought Tsinghua to another level in just a short That's period right. That's right. of time. And uh, of course, he's um, doing very well in Shanghai yes. uh, today. Yes, and, yeah. um, 
Yes. Uh, so I, I, I don't, we would love to s uh, see him come and visit us here at home. Of course, of course. No, uh, very much, you know, time flies and, and uh, we've been talking for an hour and a half and it's really great. I mean, uh, you've been leading these efforts and then promoting academic people to do exchanges uh, between China and, and USA and of course Harvard and many universities in China. That's, that's remarkable. And uh, so we really appreciate uh, your time to, to, to talk to me and also we, we would <laughs> really want to continue uh, this uh, cooperation and, uh, and also the inspiration that we're having from each other. But also I really appreciate at the beginning of your, 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 your opening remark, you mentioned about the engagement with the world. And if that's the history of all the universities and probably that's also the, uh, the spirit of all the countries. We, we need to engage, not to decouple and not to de-risk. So, so once again, I, I, I really <laughs> appreciate well, the your one thing. One thing, I, you know, <laughs> maybe you can show uh, yeah. when, when, we, when, when the of course. program airs, you can show the cover of my book, okay. Okay. which shows a beautiful building at the Nanjing University campus. Oh, great. Uh, yes. This Nanjing Dashua de Beidalo, the great northern building. Okay of Nanjing University. That's right, yes. And it's in a beautiful Chinese style. It was built not by today's Nanjing University, but by Jinling Dashue, oh, uh, which was a Chinese-American joint venture in yeah. uh, uh, 1919 mm -hmm. in a beautiful Chinese style yeah. uh, by an American architect. Oh, I see. And that American architect was an ancestor of one of my colleagues oh. here at Harvard, oh. Professor Dwight Perkins in our economics <laughs> I see. department. Okay, all the so relations, <laughs> yes. Universities, architecturally, you could look at Harvard, which has its mm -hmm. emulative architecture from different parts of the world, including from Britain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but universities are architecturally and intellectually international yes. in origin. Yes. yes. And yes. we must always remember that. Yeah, let's keep it uh, international, keep global, keep engagement. Uh, Great. So, Bill, thank you very much and for Henry, your time. Henry, thank you so much for the work that you're doing to <laughs> okay. for dialogue across the Pacific. So, thank, thank, you. thank you very much, Bill. Great. Okay, Take good. Care. Okay, thank you. So we finished this uh, episode of a CCG Special Global Dialogue at uh, Weiner Library at Harvard uh, campus. Thank you very much for viewing this. Thank you. Goodbye.